Good afternoon, everyone. I am Chandra Jackson, an epidemiologist and research associate at the Harvard Catalyst Clinical and Translational Science Center. It is an honor to introduce the accomplished and tenacious Mr. Sam Cass. Known as the White House Chef who wears two hats, Sam Cass is a native of Chicago and graduate of the University of Chicago where he majored in U.S. history. During college, he took a job cooking at the popular restaurant 312 Chicago, leading him to study under chefs around the world. And in 2007, Cass opened his personal chef company, Inevitable Table, which focused on serving healthy and nutritious food. He then became the personal chef to the Obamas while Barack Obama was a senator in Illinois. Upon President Obama's historic election in 2008, the Obamas chose Sam Cass as the family's personal chef at the White House. In addition to cooking five nights a week for the first family and serving as senior policy advisor for nutrition policy, Sam Cass is the executive director of the First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign, for which he was a chief architect. With 70 private partners and the involvement of a dozen federal agencies, the Let's Move campaign aims to reduce childhood obesity. Mr. Cass has also assisted Mrs. Obama in creating the first major vegetable garden at the White House since Eleanor Roosevelt's victory garden during World War II. As a White House intern during the Obama administration in 2012, I had the incredible unparalleled opportunity to work with Mr. Sam Cass and his colleagues by providing public health evidence to support the program decisions at the Let's Move campaign. So I greatly admire your accomplishments, Mr. Sam Cass, and we're very grateful that you're here to speak with us about your leadership, as well as your efforts to create both domestic and global diplomacy through culinary initiatives. Before I turn the session over to our moderator, Dr. Jay Winston, please join me in giving Mr. Sam Cass a very warm welcome to the Harvard School of Public Health and to the Voices in Leadership series. tough to compete with that yeah. introduction. You were good. Yeah, and I, I, will, I will say she was a rock star. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There. And I want to say hello as, as well to those of you in the overflow room. Um, um, I hope you'll feel a real strong part of this, even though we can't actually see her. Um, so Sam, thank you so much for, for coming today. And you know, this is a, a series about leadership in particular, so we're not going to debate back and forth the ins and outs of trans fats, et cetera. But what we're interested in learning from you is, you know, what makes you tick? How did you get from uh, public school in Chicago, where I understand your father was a, is a teacher as well? Still is. Still is, good. Um, to the east wing of the White House. So maybe we could start, if you would just, in a little bit greater detail, kind of trace the, the arc of your career from high school and a love for baseball initially okay. to uh, nutrition, uh, uh, cooking, and the White House. And then we'll take it from there. All right, I'll try to do that as efficiently as yeah. I can. Um, uh, well, first of all, it's just great to be here. And uh, hello to everybody in the overflow room. Uh, I, uh, so in, through high school and really through college, um, all I wanted to do was be a professional baseball player. Mm. And uh, when my mom would ask me, well, what else do you want to do? Or what's your plan B? I would tell her that I didn't have a plan B, that if I had a plan B, there's no way I could make it. It was hard enough to make it to the major leagues to begin <laughs> with. So, um, uh, you know, I was sort of all in. Um, Went from uh, uh, high school to a junior college. I think I was still the only person who went from a high school to a junior college ever. Um, and uh, to try to make it. Um, went to Kansas City for a year, then transferred to a school outside of Chicago, trying to get drafted. I was good, but I realized I wasn't better than all the other guys. Um, and uh, decided I needed to get a better education. Um, so I applied to the University of Chicago. Uh, that's the only place I applied, and in retrospect, <laughs> that was a really crazy thing to do. Uh, but it, it worked out, um, and sort of applied the 
uh, work ethic, determination um, that you know baseball had instilled in me you know, to to studies. Mm -hmm. In some ways, you know, for the first time, and with that kind of intensity, um, and. Uh, so I was there, I majored in U.S. history, um, always loved food and mm -hmm. sort of was interested in it, but never had any notion of becoming a chef or mm -hmm. working in the field. I just wanted to uh, learn how to cook for my future family when, whenever it would come one day. Um, so I got a job in a restaurant one summer. Uh, I was told my friend's boyfriend at the time that I liked that one day I'd go to culinary school and they, he said, well, why don't you just save your $80,000 and just come hang out in the kitchen with me. Huh. And I, so I did and, and loved it. And then when I had one semester left and I uh, uh, got into an abroad program, um, got waitlisted into that abroad program actually, mm -hmm. and uh, sort of knocked down the door of the dean of the um, abroad program and sort of pleaded in no uncertain terms that I just, I would promise him that I would make the most of this opportunity. He just had to get me in somewhere. I didn't care where I went. So I ended up going to um, Vienna. There's a leadership lesson in that. There's a, there's a couple really of those moments yeah. throughout which uh -huh. we could probably go back to. Yeah. Uh, oh, got to Vienna, sort of said to the head of the program in Vienna, um, you know, I'm interested in food, like maybe I could hang out in a pastry shop because, you know, there's great pastry here once a week or something like that. <laughs> Health really wasn't on the radar at that point. Uh, and, um, and the head of my program, this is actually the connection, the head of my program's husband's uncle's friend from college son rode bicycles with the sous chef of the best restaurant in Vienna. And so that's actually what it was. Uh, um, and the third day I got to Vienna, I met this crazy guy uh, who became a lifelong friend. The fourth day I was in the kitchen and I just never left. Um, so I stayed there for about, um, three and a half months as I finished school. Uh, so I would go in the morning, work the lunch service, race to the class between two and four, which is when the restaurant closed down, then race back to the restaurant after, um, uh, after, after school to do dinner service with them, work till midnight, maybe have a beer or two after, because uh, that's how they do it in kitchens, particularly in Vienna, and then go to bed at God knows what hour and wake up and do it all over again. Um, so I did that for uh, three months, three and a half months. Had to come home because I didn't have a visa. I tried to get a visa. That didn't work out so well, so I just went back without a visa. Oh. Um, <laughs> another leadership lesson. Another leadership lesson. We can, we can get back to that one. So I worked there um, uh, for about a year before I was asked to leave. Uh, not by the restaurant. Uh, uh, and then I basically spent, um, so I got trained sort of old school throw you in the fire, mm -hmm. read, work your butt off until you mm -hmm. figured it out, failed a lot. Um, uh, and then, uh, which in a lot of ways was very much like baseball, cooking in that kind of environment is just mm -hmm. like sport. Mm -hmm. um, you have to perform every day, oh, you're, perf you're a player on the team, but like if you mess up, just like baseball, like everybody knows you messed up. Oh. Um, um, and it's just grueling physical work, as, mm -hmm. but it's also mental and confidence has a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. Um, trusting your skills and your movements and your abilities. Um, so then I traveled basically, cooked and traveled around the world for the next sort of three and a half, four years, studying all kinds of aspects of food as I went, um, both the culinary, but then also much more political. I spent a lot of time in Mexico studying corn and the systems of, and the history of corn and the systems that were in play. Um, and then was, uh, had, so basically spent about five years out in the world was kind of ready to not be flat broke uh, and just traveling with a bag on my back. And so went to, um, back to Chicago, got reconnected with the Obamas, and uh, so the rest is history. But how did that reconnection happen? Um, uh, uh, you know, I'm from the same uh, neighbor from Hyde Park, so mm -hmm. sm it's a small community, and sort of uh, through the grapevine, the first lady heard that I was back, had known her sort of a little bit in, in high school. And it was right when the campaign was starting mm -hmm. and they needed just a little help uh, with the kids because the kids were quite young, mm -hmm. uh, making sure they were getting some just decent food. They had no support back then. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one guy helped with some few things, but that, mm -hmm. that was it. It was just them and, and grandma. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I started helping, and, but I'd been working and studying. I'd 
put down the cookbooks and had been studying sort of food policy books uh, for years at that point, and then really sort of dove into all the issues around food and health and what was really going on in the country. And as you learn how to cook, you start asking the question where your food comes from, and you see all the farmers bringing food in, and you quickly start thinking about the implications of what you're buying and mm. who's it coming from and how it was grown. And you look out in the kitchen and you see uh, it's pretty clear there's a lot of issues that we're facing uh, around health because of what we're eating. And as a chef, as you're putting food down on the plate, that becomes apparent about, okay, what, what are the implications of what I'm serving to the people who are consuming it? And so that set me very early on, very in the beginning of my training, sort of on a path of really trying to explore those questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, away we went. So away you went. So he wins the election. He wins the election. And go on. When, <laughs> <laughs> one day you woke up and you were in the East Room. And <laughs> um, well, you know, this is, these are issues that the First Lady really uh, has always cared about uh, yeah. as a mom and right. uh, somebody who's cared about health for a long time, worked at the hospital in the University of Chicago. Um, and she was grappling with these issues as, as a mom. Um, and so she, um, we had talked, you know, at length about all these mm -hmm. issues. And, um, and, you know, she really wanted to work on realizing that if she, uh, you know, a woman who was well-educated and had mm -hmm. plenty of resources, was struggling with how to feed her kids well, yeah. um, parents across the country most certainly were, and obviously that's true. Um, and so the idea was let's plant a garden and see uh, what the response was. Mm -hmm. You know, we thought that could be a very powerful way to symbolically step into the issue mm -hmm. um, and, and, and see how it went. And from there, if it went well, we would really take on a broader campaign around child, childhood health. And that's basically what happened. Um, okay. It was the first thing we really did when we got in. Uh, it was incredible success. Um, not just domestically, but also internationally, it was quite interesting. The response across the world was mm -hmm. phenomenal. And, you know, from there, you know, basically Let's Move uh, was, was born. Yeah, so with Let's Move, I mean, the first lady eventually settled on her <coughs> signature initiative as childhood nutrition and fitness and obesity prevention, and probably because she understood that it's a non-controversial issue. Everyone wants good child nutrition. There'd be no controversy or <laughs> opposition to what she was about to do, right? <laughs> uh, turns out that it's, and that's part of what we want to talk with you about today, it's one of the most highly contested areas. Uh, and um, before, uh, interesting to, to me is that many of, and I think there's a broad consensus within the public health community that the First Lady and you, through uh, Let's Move, have made really important contributions in changing the conversation, mm -hmm. uh, really, to, to focus attention on the linkage between nutrition and health and the future good health and development of our children all going back uh, to their early and then childhood uh, nu nu nutrition. So, and I, and I think as well that some of the most significant achievements that you all have had, interestingly, have been with the private sector, with the commercial sector. Mm -hmm. They've been remarkably responsive in a lot of ways. And some of the difficulties that if you've run into has to do with the, the, the public sector. But um, maybe it would be great to hear your short list of the most important I mean, recognizing that uh, that Let's Move is uh, is uh, is uh, still the jury is still out on the ultimate long-term success of it, mm -hmm. uh, but that there have been really important achievements to date. <laughs> what would you list as the most important, concrete, specific achievements? Yeah, um, absolutely. Before I get to that, I will say that um, we were under no false uh, I know. pretense. I just want to be clear yeah. that uh, what we were walking into. Right. And um, uh, we worked very hard to position the issue in a way that was very difficult to attack, mm -hmm. uh, which is part of the reason the message around just focusing very closely on childhood obesity was the one we picked. Um, but um, uh, it is hard to be against getting better health for kids, mm -hmm. which is why part of the reason why we've had such great success was because from the outset, we worked very hard to put ourselves in a very strong mm -hmm. Uh, 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 orientation to the to what is 
wildly controversial issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I just want to be clear. Oh, yeah. uh, that was a lot my of times, at humor. So. Uh, no, I understand, but 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 it's <laughs> but it's um it well it is funny to me uh, that um, a lot of times people try to characterize her work as uh, she took on this sort of fluffy, nice, mm -hmm. easy issue, and it's like I can't think of many that are more yeah. complicated and more difficult to navigate with more uh, interests mm -hmm. who have a stake in ultimate outcomes here. Um, in terms of our most, uh, you know, sort of our top accomplishments, I mean, there's some very like specific ones, and I think broader ones that are a little harder to have like real metrics around. But I think first and foremost, um, we've moved the issue. I think the first ladies played a huge role in moving the issue from uh, more of a advocate expert conversation to squarely in the mainstream consciousness. And I think you're seeing, um, you know, you just see this in this sort of discourse, everyday discourse. Uh, all the time now. Mm -hmm. And I think she's been uh, very effective at speaking um, about these issues in a language that people understand. And we've also worked very hard to bring this issue to where people are, mm -hmm. as opposed to expecting everybody to come to us. Uh, and, and where we are, um, we need to bring these issues to all the areas and places and TV shows and programs that people are living. And we're going to be much more effective. So I think that's been very effective. Um, the the work in schools has been transformative. I think um, we're we're seeing right now junk food is out of schools, mm -hmm. like today. Mm -hmm. uh, um, chips are baked mm -hmm. and there's no sugary drinks and um, there's no candy bars in schools. I mean that's like yeah. a big deal yeah. above and beyond the increased standards around uh, the food that's served at school lunch and the marketing that no longer can be marketed at school. Yeah, I wouldn't have put money on those achievements having <laughs> occurred, but they did. It's they did. A remarkable breakthrough. Yeah, yeah, huge breakthrough. And we're not going to see, to your point, the results, particularly in the data, mm -hmm. for years. Yeah. Uh, I think it'll start showing up three, four, five years from now. But um, but it's going to be, it's a game changer. Yeah. Um, so that's a big one. I think um, we're making a lot of progress with the private sector. There's some, been some really big collaborations that um, uh, I think are, are going to be big. The, the work with Walmart was, I think, transformative uh, in lowering the cost of fruits and vegetables, lowering the cost of <laughs> whole grain or the healthier options like low-fat milk or, or whole grain bread, which before people have had to pay more for and mm -hmm. they had to choose before price and health. Um, reducing salt by 25%, reducing sugar by 10% across the whole store, not just their products, every product. So that has an impact across the whole supply chain. The work on marketing, we're doing a big thing with Sesame Street or our marketing of water, um, or the drink up, you are what you drink campaign, uh, has shown a shift about 3% increased consumption for people who've been expo you know, seeing the marketing of a healthier product. Marketing in general is just a huge issue, mm -hmm. um, one that, that we have a long way to go on, mm -hmm. um, both in, and this is where I think leadership you, you know, comes in about how do we pressure and push on limiting unhealthy marketing to kids. And some companies like Disney have done transformative work on making sure that no, none of their assets are being used to uh, promote unhealthy foods to the kids. But then also, how do we um, promote and market the healthier options like fruits, vegetables, whole grains to compete with the marketing of uh, you know, be happy, drink or eat me and be happy, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, we've been saying, by, broccoli is vitamin B, you should be so excited about it, you know? <laughs> Here's a pamphlet. It's like, you know, and so I think figuring out those areas where we can really make progress, so I'm very proud of that work. Um, so we're doing, we're doing well, there's a long way to go. Um, but I'd say the last thing I'd say to answer that, I think she's been able to facilitate an incredible amount of energy and activity mm -hmm. that's really transcended Let's Move, that is happening in all kinds of ways. I mean, we just bump into it in cafeterias or in community centers where mm -hmm. somebody's just sort of seen this and they just went to work mm -hmm. and is doing all kinds of amazing things. And, and that's the kind of thing I, I don't have, I can't tell you, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I don't have metrics exactly on that, yeah. but that's the shift that's underway and yeah, it's quite it's exciting. A movement, it's a real movement yeah. that's happening. So how do you organize your work? I mean, you work out of the East Wing of the White House. You have a, you know, you're taking on a lot of vested interests that who, who have millions and millions of dollars to spend. Uh, um, what's the size of your staff, for example, in this David and Goliath situation? Um, kind of? So we are at the, the uh, we are a mighty team of four, uh, myself included, yeah. uh, and an intern, um, which is, we're at our, I've never had this much staff. Wow. 
Uh, uh, so I'm like feeling like a king right now when it comes to that. Um, so you, that but does that for include the first lady? Probably. No, no, no. <laughs> she's she's in her hole. She's in yeah. her league by herself. Um, but you've got the bully pulpit, and you've got. We have a big bully pulpit, lady. and I will say that. This is an administration-wide effort. Mm -hmm. So there are people in the Domestic Policy Council that are working on these issues at USDA and HHS, mm -hmm. devote a lot of uh, yeah. energy and resource to this. But across the whole Department of Defense, Transportation, lots of different agencies, Interior, yeah. um, have a real stake in a, in a healthier country because they're all dealing with the symptoms of an unhealthy country, right? And so working to get to the root of that is 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 vital to the long-term sustainability and, and prosperity of the country. So we have real buy-in uh, uh, yeah. across the administration. A staff of four is actually, I think, a magic number. It's it's what we had here at the Harvard School of Public Health when we t set out to import the designated driver concept from Scandinavia to the U.S. And what we did was we leveraged relationships yeah. on the outside with all the Hollywood studios right. and the TV networks. So we actually had a massive budget to bring to bear, although it was the, the bully pulpit, not like the First Lady, and the power of those relationships that we had to rely on, budgets that we didn't control, but we needed to tap in order to achieve the, the, the visibility that we were able to do. We're able to generate about a hundred million dollars per year yeah. in, in uh, airtime for for the message. The first lady can all, do almost that much just but with, with the flick of a switch if she decides to make those appearances. Yeah. But say a little bit about the the, the messaging challenges around mm -hmm. the complexity of the nutrition area mm -hmm. in contrast to the narrow focus of the designated driver message and how you've grappled with messaging over the last few years. Yeah. I think it's one of the uh, one of the great challenges of this space. Um, I think in all the successful like designated drivers, seat belts, other other uh, other successful sort of campaigns, I've shifted the culture around any of those things. It's been about one very clear action: smoking, don't smoke. Um, whereas food and nutrition is much uh, and exercise is much more complex and much harder to capture. Uh, what is a healthy way of living and a healthy diet in a in a, in a line, um, and uh, and so you want to. I mean, we've been very careful to not you know reduce this issue to like one simple sentence or target one food because it just leaves out everything else. Mm -hmm. And I think there's no magic bullet. We we love to look for the magic bullet here. If we only would just stop doing eating this or stop doing that or this one thing would be solved, everything would be fine. And mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is, is obviously it's just not true. So we've tried to work though to distill very simple messages mm -hmm. that if people can make those changes, and we also say the same things to companies, we, we will go uh, a long way towards solutions. So my plate was a real attempt at that. If you look at the old pyramid, I mean you look at that thing and you're just like, God, God bless it, I'm not trying to <laughs> diss, diss the pyramid, but it was a complicated piece of business in and of itself. And you look at it, you didn't know, I mean, what is this? The person's climbing up, or are they supposed to eat the fats coming down? I mean, what, I, you know, I didn't understand. So we tried to really simplify it, and we had a few key messages, like fill half your plate with fruits and vegetables, drink water, uh, and not sugary drinks, um, enjoy your food, but eat less. First time the government has ever recommended eating less food. Um, those kind of very clear things that we have worked very hard to sort of pound mm -hmm. and break through on just some simple things that if people did those basic things, mm -hmm. um, we, we'd, we'd be in a, in a far better place. Mm -hmm. So we're making progress, but we're still learning. And this is a conversation that is going to, in the, in, in, for stakeholders in the issue, that's just going to have to, we're going to have to keep working and learning and testing and, and doing a better job. At. I will say one thing that I've learned is that the more we take a marketing approach around these Mm -hmm. issues and try to market uh, these better uh, behaviors, m market uh, through like an emotional connection, mm -hmm. uh, a healthier way of life, mm -hmm. the more successful we're going to be. Mm -hmm. The reason why billions and billions are spent on marketing is because it works really, really well. Right. And I think if we're going to offset a lot of that, we're going to have to take the same kind of approach. So that's, you know, we're working hard on that. Yeah. So our previous uh, Dean, Barry Bloom, actually rewrote the mission statement of the Harvard School of Public Health, which initially talked about research and education. He added communication yeah. right up there with it as the third pillar, yeah. recognizing that without effective communication, we can't do effective, um, uh, effective public health. So, but kind of 
in your position, you're yes. interacting with and dependent on, and in a lot of ways, the Department of Agriculture, yeah. the FDA, you're interacting with the advocacy groups yeah. from lots of different industries, from the potato industry from, to the beverage industry <laughs> to the frozen food industry. Yeah. They're all organized separately and they all have their own interests yeah. and they all have relationships directly with Capitol Hill so that when the Secretary of Agriculture shows up at an appropriations uh, hearing and, and uh, Senator uh, Susan Collins from Maine appears, she walks in carrying a head of lettuce uh, and a potato. And she waves the potato at the Secretary of Agriculture and says, what do you have against the potato? Which the farmers in her state uh, are, are making their livelihood from. So it's a contentious area. And when you wake up in the morning, kind of, and you look at that back blackberry that you're still carrying, that blackberry bowl, I've got one at home too. <laughs> um, how, do you, how do you organize yourselves to plan for the longer haul mm -hmm. when you're faced with all of this incoming fire from a lot of different directions? You know, I think, um, I think it's important to, uh, to understand that once you get into, once you, have the responsibility of solving some of these problems as opposed to critiquing the uh, situation. Mm -hmm. um, your orientation switches from what you hope it to be to starting from what it is mm -hmm. and where we are. What, like it or not, we are where we are. And the question that becomes is what steps do we need to take uh, to get ourselves to a better place to where the public health is greatly improved, to where we're protecting the interests of kids. And that is sort of the core orientation. That's like the starting point. And um, basically, you step back and look, where are their opportunities? Where's the fruit ripe? Mm -hmm. Where are their opportunities that for a certain you know, set of dynamics, mm -hmm. there's an opportunity to make a lot of progress here, be it a policy play, be it a partnership, what, what have you. And I think it's also important to know, to, to remember that there's going to be times where um, we agree with certain groups on certain issues and can work together, be it across the aisle or with a business who's got an interest in a certain set of things, that on this, we totally agree and like we think we can make some real progress here that we believe genuinely will help people live better lives. Mm -hmm. And then on this other issue, we're gonna disagree and we may um, really battle it out mm -hmm. uh, behind the scenes or in, 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 in the public square. Um, and that's okay. Or you might decide to sidestep a particular battle for a period of time Absolutely. in order to make progress elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Sometimes um, the, as much as um, people equate like a fight with like um, commitment to an issue or like willingness to take it on, um, sometimes and oftentimes it's just not strategically the smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. Because you end up then just fighting for the sake of fighting. Mm -hmm. People feel very good when there's a lot of like pointing and yelling back and forth, but it actually is not accomplishing anything. So sometimes you gotta draw hard lines where it's important. We've drawn a very hard line around school nutrition, for example, and we have no intention of wavering at all on that. Um, uh, uh, continue to provide flexibility where it's appropriate and where it's needed, but not to roll back. Mm -hmm. um, but in other things, um, um, it's not ready, we're not in the right place for that, mm -hmm. you know, battle. Or maybe there's, with some time, we can work to get to a place where there's common ground where we can take care of the majority of the issue we're trying to solve. May not be perfect, mm -hmm. but we can make tremendous progress much more quickly than if we tried to fight for the next five years mm -hmm. to get to a certain place. And I think part of what, you know, my job is, and people who work in the White House and across the government, is balancing all those different uh, issues uh, and, and constituencies around an issue, identify those places where if we came together we can make that progress, mm -hmm. and, and select, you know, getting input. I think a huge part of it is um, working with people along the way mm -hmm. and soliciting input and buy-in from the beginning mm -hmm. and get a real understanding of what's driving anybody's um, uh, interest. I mean, I don't want to, you know, not to go back to the example because we don't need to talk about that too much, mm -hmm. Uh, but you know the issue around potato farmers is real. I mean, those are people's oh, yeah. livelihoods, sure. and it's not um, that it goes in conflict at times with other. You know, that's just one example. There's a lot of those, but these are you know issues that you got to balance and weigh. Mm -hmm. Looking ahead, um, including to the time when the next president is sworn in, 
Uh, I hear tell you intend you'd like very much to stick with these issues for the longer haul. What do you have in mind? <laughs> um, if you have any good ideas. <laughs> Uh, I'm I also all, I'm understand only... the First Lady wants to stick oh, with yeah. for this the is, longer haul. This is something that she came to the White House uh, living and working on and yeah. breathing in her own life. This is something that I think she intends on working on you know, for many, many years. Um, I do as well. I think there's, um, you know, I think uh, policy is just one part of uh, solving this problem. And, and, I, and I think in the end what we're talking about is who we are as a people. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, this conversation is what we eat and how we live goes to the very core of our uh, of who we are who our uh, our cultural identity is and um, that change is changing it within that context is what's permanent and, and policy sometimes will lead but most often it'll follow that those cultural shifts you know and the culture moving will create the space mm -hmm. to then do school lunch right we didn't just come in and do it like it wasn't you know People have been working on that for a long time, decades, and the country was starting to wake up to that. And I think we were able to help catalyze and really get behind it and push forward as we you know, worked with a lot of groups and parents. But it's that relationship that's important. So I'm going to continue to look for opportunities, and I know the First Lady will whenever, uh, when we leave, to continue that push and that shift both in the policy world but also in the cultural in the cultural realm, which is why you've seen her on Jimmy Fallon doing mom dancing and, and all those places because that's a huge part of, of um, making this fun and enjoyable and something that we want to do. I'm glad you're going to stick with it because a lot of us in public health see the First Lady and you as genuine heroes of public health. Uh, so thank you for everything that you do. It's very kind. But before opening this to Q&A, um, tell me about the fig tree. <laughs> the fig, the famous fig. Uh, so the <laughs> the fig tree, the fig tree is my my baby, which is now all grown up. Uh, so we got this fig tree uh, from Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, uh, and uh, it was it, they had passed. If I don't know if anybody's been to Monticello, but it's beautiful, and and Thomas Jefferson really helped completely change our whole orientation to growing food. Um, he really was one of the first, at least document, anyways. Uh, seasonal farming, right, where we weren't fighting nature. The European approach was very much always fighting nature and trying to conquer nature. And he sent his emissaries out across the world to bring back, with the direction of bring back seeds from all over the world. And they smuggled seeds illegally often at times from all over the world. And so he started learning to plant cool weather crops like lettuce and spinach and broccoli in the spring and hotter things like okra and sweet potatoes and other you know uh, various other crops in the summer and then back to the cool so anyways you see that all Monticello and they have the, this fig tree that they still grow there that, that he grew um, and so I got it we got a little a little baby one and so we planted it in this bed and had um, mint around it and uh, we have volunteers that come to help weed once a week and uh, I went down there, I was checking on this fig. I don't know why, but I just really was attached to this fig. Checked on it like daily. Uh, this was our second year there. And I went down there one day and it was just gone. And it's, so I had this moment of panic. I look up at the compost. We have a compost in the White House. And ran over to it and there it was laying on the oh, top wow. of it for two and a half days. Oh, so I replanted it and it was really upset with us and would not grow at all for another year. But now, I, I would have been mad. <laughs> I, I would have been mad too. I mean, I you know I don't know what to tell you. And um, and then uh, it's just taken off ever Good. since. Okay. And we just had this huge fig harvest this year. It was unbelievable, yeah. and the figs were amazing. Cool. So it was fun. We have fun out there. Yeah, I guess. Questions? Don't be shy. Yeah, there's one. And then in the front. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Coffee Dixon. Um, one, I'd like to thank you and to let the First Lady know I am an achievement of the MOVE campaign. I'm actually a woman of color here in Boston who, because of, because of the MOVE campaign, decided to go into farming. That's great. And not only that, but take on a leadership role and encourage other women of color to go into production farming to address food systems work in urban communities. That's great. So as you and the First Lady move into other ideas, 
How do you look at increasing the numbers of, from 1% of people of color that farm into larger numbers, and what do you foresee mm -hmm. as a future role mm -hmm. for small farming in addressing food issues? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I think it plays out on a lot of different levels. Um, and ask her to come see us. We'd love to say hello. <laughs> <laughs> love to come see you. Yes, thank you. Um, um, I think community gardens and urban farms are, are really important strategies to augment uh, uh, diet in particularly underserved communities that don't have uh, uh, good grocery stores in them that are providing healthy food. I don't, I don't think they can surplant the grocery store and I think we need to continue to work hard to build that infrastructure so all communities have access to healthy and affordable food. But I think those gardens are important to augment. I also think they help and those uh, s uh, small farms help um, reconnect people with um, their health and the connection to food and also to the community themselves. I mean, everywhere we go, we see um, these gardens and, and farms to become sort of centers of the community. And that's a very powerful force that so much else you know, can blossom from. Um, the USA is working very hard on this issue in terms of helping to encourage and incentivize more uh, people of color to farm. We're seeing increases that are pretty exciting. Um, and there's a lot, but there's of course a lot more work to do. I think um, regional food systems, sustainable food systems, are, we're investing a lot of resource into that. I think it's you know, increasingly gonna be the way that has to go as energy prices continue to go up. Um, uh, and, and we're seeing great progress. So I think the key in this whole thing is um, there's not one way. And I think so many of these questions we try to just, this is the only way it can be. And I, and I think that much more important is the, is, is the sense of diversity. And I think the more diverse our system is in terms of different ways we are nourishing ourselves, both big farms and small and the people in the middle as well, um, uh, and the people, the kind of people who are farming, the stronger our system is gonna be. And I think, so we're working very hard at, at encouraging that. But it's gonna take all approaches to overcome the challenges we have to really feed ourselves in a healthy way. Hi, my name is Ashkan Afshin. I'm from the Department of Epidemiology. It's a pleasure to have you at Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, I was wondering if uh, you could uh, a little bit elaborate on the process of obtaining scientific evidence to mm. inform your campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question uh, is about scientific evidence and how do we, how do we uh, utilize that. It's a very good question. Uh, we've worked very hard to anything that we do is evidence-based. Um, and, and based on the late, not just evidence, but the latest research that we have. It's something that has been uh, directed from the president across the entire administration, not just us, but we certainly have taken that upon ourselves. Um, so we draw on lots of sources of data. Um, uh, we draw on government data, a lot of USDA data, a lot of HHS data. Um, CDC provides a lot of, of critical studies. But we also uh, rely on a lot of outside work, the Institute of Medicine. The Institute of Medicine is quite an important one. Uh, their work really underpins a lot of the policy making that we do by law. Um, all of our, all of our um, nutritional guidance and policy comes it's based on the dietary guidelines for Americans. So that is an underpinning. Um, but we're constantly, you know, of course, we're, we're, we're paying close attention to what comes out of the Harvard School of Public Health. Of course. <laughs> uh, uh, and, um, but really trying to learn. This is, a, you know, the, the science moves quickly in this field. We're learning a lot. There's a lot we don't know. Um, and, you know, sometimes you have to make a decision with imperfect research base. Um, and, and you got to be very careful in that space because you don't, you, you, you know, you, the last thing you want to do is make something worse or create a new problem. So it's, it's a vital uh, approach, but we bring in all the evidence, we weigh uh, what it's saying and figure out, you know, based on that, what's the best, best approach to, to take. Yeah. Hi, my name is Avik Chatterjee. I'm a master's student here and a physician and a, a pediatrician. One of the projects I'm working on now is with uh, a couple of public schools in Dorchester, Massachusetts mm -hmm. uh, here. And um, 
uh, evaluating their school food programs, and we've learned a lot of interesting things. But um, I met with some of the school administration the other day, and one of the big challenges they have is cost. So this school mm -hmm. is committed to cooking all their food from scratch in their own kitchen, using lots of fruits and vegetables, all whole grain products, yep. um, and just having healthy food for their students. But it, it's, they lose money on every meal, and they're yep. worried about that. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you think is going to happen to cost for uh, some of these schools as they implement the USDA guidelines and, and try to be healthy for their students? Yeah. I think, um, so cost is a concern, and it has always been a concern, uh, and it's a challenge for every district, no question. Um, I think that we're getting better at it. I think part of um, uh, the, the approach is, as we do this more, we're gonna become much more efficient. We're gonna learn how to purchase much more uh, efficiently in terms of our price. Um, you know, we're constantly trying to find more resource. Uh, we fought for more resource in the last farm bill. We got, uh, it was a hard fight to get what we got. Um, uh, so it's gonna be an ongoing challenge. What we're seeing though is that the districts who are doing what, as you described, who like are bought in, who care about it and are really working at it are, are really figuring it out. And, um, and they're gonna see, they're seeing their participation go up. I think the key is participation going up. Then the better the food is, the more kids are gonna eat it. Um, we've also seen in a lot of districts, and I don't know if this will be true for yours, um, we, we passed the community eligibility uh, provision, which is a provision that basically we've implemented it, which um, for all schools that have 60% or more free and reduced, 40% uh, more free or reduced lunch uh, um, percentage, you can do universal free breakfast and free lunch. And that's a game changer in terms of covering all the kids who really need it and reducing the administrative costs so more of that money can go into the food. Um, so uh, we're making progress there, but this is just one that we're gonna have to keep working through. And the USDA is providing a ton of technical assistance. There's like simple things that can be done that can go a long way uh, to reducing those kind of overhead that's eating up a lot of the, the ultimate cost. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi, Sam. Eric Graham. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Nutrition. It's great to see you. Um, I liked your point about uh, communication being sort of where you see the greatest successes in the future. Um, ironically, you came from baseball, where if you watch a baseball game now, you see Gatorade and you see advertise. There's our, our heroes are sports figures who advertise mm -hmm. fast food. So can you give us where you think or where some of your best successes have been in, in communication on a large scale and where you think going forward can you can help change the, the, the voice around food? Um, <laughs> I wish I, had a, I wish I had a great answer for that question because we would have been, we'd be doing it right now. <laughs> um, look, I, th I don't want to just sort of sound like a broken record, but I think that is also a result of the culture that we're in, right? Mm -hmm. And I think as things change, you're going to see more and more celebrities not wanting to brand with products that are really unhealthy for kids. Uh, and that's starting to happen. I mean, I think you're starting to see a consciousness. Now there's some big checks out there that are just huge checks, and there's, I think that's always gonna be part of the landscape. And, and companies are gonna market their products. Um, but people are more and more conscious of their brand as, as celebrities, and I think we're gonna see, I think we're gonna see some positive change there. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, figuring out our message on any one of these fronts about how do you communicate in any of your work, um, when you say what you're doing and what your goal is, like how to say it in a sentence or two, so people get what they're supposed to do or they get what you're trying to accomplish is really important. Um, and doing it in a way that's kind of irrefutable. And we've worked very hard and it's an ongoing, and, and, you know, an ongoing process, I think, as the issue evolves, how you gotta keep evolving the message. So one way that we looked at that, we started with childhood obesity, which was um, pretty airtight, right? And, um, hard to attack directly. There's like a lot of side attacks, but very hard to go on directly. Um, we've now really shifted, because of the evidence base, uh, to talk about family health as it pertains to the child, right? That we know that children are a product and result of whatever their parents are doing, really. And, the, and so we have to think about the, ch the child within the context of their families, which includes the behavior that uh, their parents are doing it opens up a much broader uh, playing field about what are the kind of things we need to do, but it makes it very clear sort of how we're structuring our message and how we're approaching the problem. Um, so thinking through that, I think, is, is, really, is really vital to get that right, because it sets the whole framework of your work and what you can actually approach and, and attack. 
in the back, I see. Hi, um, thanks for coming to talk to us today. Uh, my name is Emily. I'm a student in the Health Policy and Management Department. And um, I'm really interested in hearing a little more about what you, your focus on school health. Um, prior to coming here, I was a high school biology teacher in Baltimore, and we sort of tried to work through some of these issues of student nutrition, um, and it was a big challenge. Yeah. So I'm wondering, um, what do you see are kind of the next moves in that arena? Mm -hmm both on a policy level and on a level of um, in a school for the adults that care about kids being healthier, yeah. uh, what can they do as well? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And I think some of this, some of my answer will be in school and some of it will be after school. I think after school is a really critical time that we haven't spent enough energy on. Um, I think in school, first and foremost, we have to implement all the things we've started. Uh, we have to get the marketing out because there's a ton of junk food marketing in schools targeted at kids, which is a big, big deal. We have to get community eligibility implemented, the new standards, all that stuff. I think is really important as a first go. Um, we have a program called the Let's Move Active Schools program, uh, which has signed up you know, 10,000 uh, schools across the, the country to help get physical activity weaved in throughout the school day. Um, I think that's something that is designed around a champion in a school who wants to take action but needs the support and some resource to do so. So we're trying to figure out how to find those people that really care and give them the support and resources to, uh, to move forward within their complicated bureaucracy in any school. I think one effort that we're, we're working a lot on right now, um, to your point, is around cooking. Um, and I think cooking is one of those things where all the things we're trying to accomplish, increase fruit and vegetable consumption, increase whole grain consumption, lower sugar, portion size, et cetera. All of that happens when people cook. Um, and, uh, but, you know, home ec is largely gone. Uh, not entirely, it turns out. We've been, uh, there's an association for everything, including uh, the life sciences, as they're now called. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but it's not the model that it used to be for, by any means, and it's not going to be. So we're working very hard on um, developing uh, sort of the home ec of the future, so to speak, about how we can have a much more streamlined uh, education program that teaches the basic skills. So I'm a, I cook for the President of the United States. I basically, 80% of what I do is like 10 things. Let's just be honest, you know? <laughs> it's like, I roast, a, you know, I roast, I saute, you know, I can boil something, you know, there's a basic couple sauces, and you know, then, then the 20% is sort of the difference. But in terms of like everyday cooking, like if I'm just cooking for myself, I'm literally just doing that, right? So um, giving those basic skills to the right age kid, the right time, could change the trajectory of their whole lives, right? And so we're looking, we're working very hard to figure out uh, evidence-based, when is the right time, what are those right skills, and how to get it. And I think the after-school setting offers us a really um, valuable opportunity where this is starting to happen there already. If we provide resources in the right evidence-based sort of approach, it could be a game changer. So that's something, I think, as the next, what's next, um, that's definitely something we're working really hard on. I, I changed the name from Home Ec and try to go after boys as well and almost position so, it as a, cooking as a babe magnet. I bet you could confirm <laughs> that, right? <laughs> I can't speak to that at all. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but hold on, it's actually very important. Yeah. I, I call it the homework of the future and normally I will say it's like, but I, we're re I gotta, re we gotta rebrand it. Like, yeah. how do we talk about it? Like, yeah. that's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do we, like, right now, it's, I'm glad you brought this up. Right now, when you, people think cooking, they think stress. They think dirty dishes. They think doesn't taste good. Uh, and just, I don't got enough time. And the time is a real factor. So we got to figure out ways to do meals that are, you know, efficient and fit in people's lives. But what we need people to think when they think cooking, they think easy, delicious, fun, fun yeah. you know, and, and feel better. And, and social. Yeah. And social. Yeah. Community, love, happiness. Mm -hmm. And uh, love and happiness sells everything. And <laughs> no, it does. That's just, yeah. a, that's just a marketing fact, right? Yeah. So, um, and so, um, um, and I think, but that's exactly right. So we're working, actually a big part of what we're working on is like, how do we market cooking? Mm -hmm. um, not educate about it, but how do we really market it? And I think that, that's something that right now, that's a top priority for the first lady yeah, outside of, uh, you know, with the exception of schools. There was a couple, one right here in the second row, and then on the right, I guess. 
Hello, uh, my name is Yanni So. I'm a master's student in the epidemiology department. And I, I was wondering if you could uh, share more about what you think about the time constraint. Um, I think traditionally the female was the more domestic cook a lot. Mm -hmm. And with uh, improvements in technology, uh, you spend less time in the kitchen and you're also working more full time. Yep. So um, it's great if you like cooking. I enjoy, sorry, cooking. Um, and I would like to invest my time in it to enjoy it. But um, if cooking and health is a major concern, but the constraints of your work environment um, makes you try to manage work versus family versus leisure time, how, right. how do you tackle um, that environment itself? Because that's you might want to change your family or yourself, but if the environment yeah. is a challenge, I'm curious how you could present a policy to attack that. Yeah, well, see, this is it's less, uh, I think the answers here are less policy driven. Um, uh, but I think part of what we have to do is make cooking um, fit into our lives as opposed to try to craft policies to change our lives so that we can cook, right? Because yeah. that's just not an approach that's going to work. I mean, we are where we are. Um, and I think I can, you know, I have the skills to cook a really healthy meal that costs us like a dollar or two in like a few minutes, right? Um, it's a, a lot of it is about knowledge uh, and just a, a basic understanding of like what is a good dish and how can you do it efficiently. Even things like what do you start first, you know? No, but that, these are the kind of things where like somebody cooks the fish and then puts the rice on and then they're like pissed because they're sitting there, <laughs> their, their fish is done and disgusting in 45 minutes and the rice is just finishing up. Like things like that, I mean we've lost a basic understanding and um, a lot of people still cook but it's still, you know, it's not passed down like it used to be. So I think that's a huge part of what we have to do. I think the time constraints are real um, and I think I think the answer is not, uh, the vision is not like everybody all at home cooking these elaborate like Italian fiesta meals, right? It's like just cook one more night a week. Let's just start right there. Just one, if every, if every family in America cooked one more time, there's somebody's cooking, a lot of people cooking none, some are cooking one, two. If everybody just cooked one more night a week, it would have a major impact on overall consumption. And if then you know, over time you did two and you ate out the other couple times, I think that would be a game changer. So it's also what are our expectations and what is the ask? And I think the ask is start really simple um, and, and just we're just gonna try to add one more home cooked family meal. And by the way, as I'm sure you know, the impact of family meal beyond just health, behavior, pregnancy, drug use, school, performance, all, every, everything is increased. It's one of those fun, fundamental foundational things that can have a big impact across many, many fronts. In listening to you just now, I, I realized that your chef's hat is a badly underutilized asset because I was imagining a series of YouTube videos, each two minutes long, with tips from Sam Cass uh, reaching out to households around the country. Um, you could motivate people. Yeah, we've yeah. thought about that. We, we did actually some of that with a couple of chef friends of mine oh, for a little while. Yeah. I will say the chef, the chef part in the, you know, to bring it back to the leadership yeah. frame, um, the one thing where that has come into play is um, these changes have to taste good, right. all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, if we try to create a society that doesn't taste good, like we're not, we're gonna fail. Mm -hmm. I promise you that. I don't wanna eat food that doesn't taste good. I know you don't. And by the way, neither do kids. <laughs> Like if it doesn't taste good, these kids aren't going to eat it. And like I don't blame you for not wanting to eat that. It doesn't taste good. Um, so you know, I think um, it's important for us to remember that. And when we're up here crafting these policies, one of the things that you always have to do, and I always try to do, is really um, understand the implications of that policy on the ground to wh whoever it is it's going to impact. And that's your responsibility on every level of whatever the the outcome is, but especially like the kid who's going to eat it mm. or the the parent who's got to now deal with this new set of issues. And I think that's vital. And we've, in this case, flavor gets left out um, a lot. Mm. Um, uh, but it's something that um, is going to be vital to the sustainability and success of this long term. So we're getting close to time where we have to 
think about wrapping up. Um, and what I wanted to ask you before we do is if you would kind of reflect on, based upon your experience, what are the particular kind of skills and personality mm -hmm. traits, et cetera, that are essential to both surviving in the role that you find yourself in and then succeeding in it both and kind of um, managing the terrain hmm. of the complexity of, 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 of the environment? That's a good question. Um, in no particular order. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, first and foremost, you have to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I genuinely am, that's not just, I'm not saying that, I, I really believe that we can and will change and fix the challenges, overcome the challenges that we face. Um, and I think um, you have to have respect for all corners of the issue. You can vehemently disagree, and sometimes it's just like, all right, there's, you know, we're just gonna fight this one out. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, learning, having respect for even your perceived uh, uh, opposition on an issue understanding what's driving them uh, and trying to accommodate and take into consideration those dynamics will just make you a much more effective leader in this and be able to actually move something down the field and focus more on progress and results as opposed to um, just fights, um, which, which um, uh, we walked into a dynamic where most of it was just a lot of finger pointing about who's, who's to blame for what. And what we tried to do is create a space where everybody had a seat at the table mm -hmm. and we could figure out where we can move forward. Um, I think that's important. I think um, uh, you have to really care genuinely and deeply. Mm -hmm. I mean, authenticity and passion is mm -hmm. vital to keep you going, particularly when you haven't slept in five and a half years. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, that's what gets you through. Um, mm -hmm. And remember who you're serving. Also, you wake up every day, you know, I go into schools and I see these kids and you're just like reminded uh, why you're doing it. And I would also say just, you know, there has to be a certain level of um, tenacity mm -hmm. and relentlessness, um, uh, both in the outside world uh, in sort of dealing with the issues and people and all the interests as you referred to, but also just accomplishing anything in whatever the institution that you're dealing with. I mean, you know, be it here or wherever you go next, um, <clears throat> it's hard to get anything meaningful done yeah. for a lot of reasons. And not being discouraged and just keep pushing through yeah. um, smartly, knowing which battles to fight and which ones to let go, uh, not just taking principal stands, is, yeah. that's key. Um, and having patience, because this stuff, real change takes time. And, and we're not going to ever accomplish all this all at once. Like, no way. <laughs> and when we do good things, we all need to celebrate them and sort of point out where else we need to go. But that momentum can continue to build more momentum. And I think that feeling that relationship and that push-pull and just sticking with it over time, taking the wins as they come, I think has been quite, uh, has been part of the real foundation of the First Ladies and, and our success uh, on these issues. A perfect place to stop and a great answer to a good thank question. <laughs> thank, thank you so you. much again for coming. And please join me in thanking you. Thank you, guys. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it was fun.